Hi, everyone. My name is Alexander Dale. I am the lead for MIT Solves Sustainability and US work. Um, it's been a real honor to be able to work with UNEP and NAMPAN over the past two years um, to work on these different uh, consultations. And um, this is our second deep dive of 2021. We're excited to have so many people here to talk about the details of uh, implementing ecological connectivity within MPAs. Um, to have you get a chance to hear from colleagues both within regions and across some thematic areas. Um, to get us started with a few opening remarks, I'm going to turn the virtual microphone over to uh, Barbara Hendry, who's the director for UNEP's North America region. Barb, over to you. Thanks, Alexander. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, let me apologize at the outset in case you can hear the construction noise in the background. Uh, hopefully it won't be too disturbing, um, but I'm so pleased to welcome everyone uh, to our second deep dive on ecological connectivity organized under the umbrella of the North America Marine Protected Area Network or NAMPAM. Uh, as Alex said, I'm Barb Hendry. I'm the director of the UN Environment Program Regional Office for North America. We cover the US and Canada uh, for those of you who don't know UNEP, uh, it is the lead agency within the UN system for addressing environmental challenges globally. As the North America Regional Office, we support NAMPAM by working with the federal governments of the US, Canada, and Mexico, and the Commission for Environmental Cooperation to connect marine protected area managers in this region on key issues. And one of these, of course, is ecological connectivity. Uh, I hope some of you or many of you will remember that this was the theme of our first deep dive uh, in NAMPAM earlier this year. And the sense we got then from all of you was that there was a desire for further conversation and connection on this topic. So that's what we're here for today. We have a very distinguished panel and a good amount of time for sharing information and experiences. So I am really looking forward to an interesting discussion. And on behalf of NAMPAM, I wanna thank you very warmly for being here. Alexander, back to you. Thank you so much, Barb. It's always wonderful to have you uh, and, and have the, the work that UNEP has put into making this community real and functional and, and uh, putting in the effort to corral all the all the different pieces. Um, it is great to have learned some things from our initial deep dive earlier this year. We added a little bit more time. We've refocused on that same theme, um, but we're getting into a little bit more details. Um, as before, though, we do want to open with three really distinguished speakers from across the region um, who can speak to different sectors and different approaches to ecological connectivity. Um, and to get us all inspired uh, around these different topics. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to introduce three different panelists and ask each of them to spend just a few minutes introducing themselves and their work before I move into a little bit more conversation and questions. Um, so our three panelists today, uh, first will be Barbara Lauschi, um, who's the director of the Marine Policy Institute and also has been the lead author for the IUCN's recent Rules of Thumb on Marine Connectivity document. Uh, second, second is Eduardo Ponce, who's the director of um, species programs, uh, species at risk um, at CONAM in Mexico. Uh, and third is Fred Horisky, who's the executive director of the Ocean Tracking Network. Um, and we'll hear about all of their different work uh, over the next half hour. Um, but to get us started, um, Barb, I'm going to turn it over to you. And Rachel, um, if you wanted to pull up some slides. So Barb has some visuals to accompany her intro. Very good. Um, so you'll see, this is uh, the first slide. I'm getting a little bit of uh, some instruction on top of it, Rachel. Is there something I can do? Realize it should clean itself up in a moment. Oh, okay. Anyway, greetings, everybody. Um, I've met a few of you, but not most. I um, like Alexander said, I'm, I'm Robert Aushi, work with MOAT, 
marine laboratory and also a UCN and marine protected, the marine uh, connectivity working group. Now, this first slide is a, a photo of the cover of the publication that I'm going to use sort of as the base. And the publication, um, Alexander, I'm still getting this square. Okay. Okay. Um, there will be there will be a little bit of lag in every time there's a, a slide switch just to okay. manage the video. Okay. Okay. That one out. Um, the the blue image on your screen on the right is the cover of the publication, and the link below is where you can find it. Um, we started working with these rules of thumb in 2019 when the Marine Connectivity Working Group um, was launched. Um, and we did this because there was quite a bit of literature out there, including from some who will participate today, indicating that um, ecological connectivity among is among the most infrequent and ineffectively applied um, ecological criteria in MPA design. And so we don't really have a strong science yet. The next possibility is rules of thumb. So this is why we've got rules of thumb and they should cover both science and policy. We did this to get MPA managers to have a checklist for best practice and connectivity. And as you will see, if you download the, the full document, which is not very long, um, there are good practical tips, including um, going across jurisdictions. So we're dealing with land and sea and national waters and international waters. The climate change issue has to be in there. So it is, uh, particularly because with connectivity, we see this as, as a way to um, really build resilience. Now, I, I wanted to put down here at the bottom, one of the definitions of several that we have in the, in the booklet on ecological connectivity. This one is for species. We have one for ecosystems, et cetera. But, but for species, the fundamental movement of populations, individuals, genes, gomets, and propagules between populations, communities, and ecosystems, as well as the structural connection of non-living material from one location to another. So that's the this is not our definition, it's the definition from IUCN and a, a major publication that came out last year on ecological connectivity. Okay, Rachel, we can go to the next slide now. So I'm just meant, I just shorthanded mentioned three of the rules of thumb. One is the first one that connectivity always needs to be considered. After you consider it, you may not need to deal with it, but it must always be considered. Uh, the rule number three is that when you're working with connectivity and you're working with climate change, you need to look at the effects of ocean processes, which is currents, temperature, vertical, horizontal um, dimensions, um, chemistry, and then you need to look at the land-based processes, so, you, so the influence of the land on the water. Uh, then rule number 11, uh, we picked out to highlight the value of modeling, habitat modeling. And that's because we don't know a lot about many things that we want to protect. So we work with target species or ecosystems or communities, and then we do we we suggest that habitat modeling might be um, the best way to get started. Next slide. 
Okay, now I'm going, this is, this is my last slide and it is um, illustrating those three rules of thumb. Um, the first one, of course, uh, they are considering connectivity. Um, the third rule of thumb on ocean processes. One of the reasons the, the Gulf of California and Mexico is so critical for um, including analysis of what's going on with the ocean is that um, during the summer and part of the year, the currents are going north which means that larvae and, and, and various habitat needs and life cycle needs are going on. In the winter, the current reverses itself and goes south. So now the larvae are going to be moving that way. Your habitat needs are going to be in that direction. And it really has a different outcome for your management plan. The second little set of figures here, habitat suitability, is, um, is an actual experiment. And it comes from um, looking at the habitat of, I'm going to actually name it, the, the um, leopard grouper and this is here when um, we're just looking at presently the normal sea and the temperature and when you see the second one b you see uh, the leopard grouper nursery habitat and that is now being affected by by climate change and we can see the refuge the refuge is going down um, and then the third one is areas where both ranges are the, the habitat and the species are being affected by climate so you have a much diminished um, habitat suitability as you're working through your modeling which has big implications for how you deal with design and how you deal with climate change. So those are the, the four slides I wanted to show you. Um, I think we should move on to the next speaker. What do you think, Alejandro? I think, I think that sounds great. Thank you so much for, for that intro. And I think it's such a good framing space on both what is ecological connectivity and giving us just a quick snapshot of putting some of those rules of thumb into practice and looking forward to getting a, a longer discussion on examples to where we might apply them. And I know we have a, a poll for the audience as well. Um, the next up, I'd like to um, go to Eduardo um, to share a little bit about the work that uh, he is doing at Conan um, and particularly with the Blackfooted Albatross. Eduardo, over to you. Gracias, Alexander. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, nice to be here today with you. I'm, I'm pleased to be uh, sharing this information uh, with all in this forum. I think it's very important to continue the communication, the collaboration uh, related with marine uh, connectivity, which is a big challenge, you know, right now at this moment on the world, we are living in a very, very uh, uh, at uh, that moment, I, I would say uh, we, we are living in an extinction process and we are living in a very, very de delicate process uh, in the, not just on the seas, but uh, in general in all the, the, the ecosystems. So the spaces like this, the forums like this are a great opportunity to share experiences and to share uh, all the information that we have among the three countries. So. I'm going to present an example of uh, connectivity that we are working uh, between Mexico and US. And I, I pointed out uh, the, the points that, um, Barbara, that, that Barbara said in, in on his talk. So next, please. Uh, first, I'm going to just uh, talk about the, uh, what is the situation in Mexico. 
Mexico right now, we have a 37 protected marine areas. They are distributed in both coast and the country. And we are, we have the fortune to, to have eight, 11,000 kilometers of coast, which, you know, is, is a lot of areas uh, and a lot of ecosystem distributed on this area, on this, again, uh, on this coast. And on the, on these 37 protected marine areas, we have, uh, we protect uh, 89 mil million hectares uh, on the marine territory, which is 22% uh, of the uh, marine territory in Mexico, which is a lot. I mean, in, uh, in the terrestrial uh, territory, we have protected uh, the 13%. So in the, in the marine area, we have 22%, which is a lot. And well, you know, it's a big responsibility to manage all this area. One special aspect on Mexico is that uh, more than almost all the islands are protected. No, and there's a lot of work on the on this marine uh, ecosystem. Uh, so we we have a, a lot of island in Mexico, and you know more than almost thousand islands, and almost all of them are protected. So uh, and well, we have a, as Barbara said, and this is also a particularity in, here in Mexico. We have an exclusive sea, which is the Mark of Cortez. Which you know, I, all of you know that this is a, one of the most diverse marine ecosystems in the world. So it's very important to understand what is happening. And the, the, with the points that Barbara mentioned, I think it's it's great to, to discuss uh, all those points uh, related with marine connectivity. So now, on the next one, uh, I'm going to present a, 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 I think a very nice example of how can we work together. To protect and to 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 keep the marine connectivity, and it's uh, related with seabirds. You know, uh, North America is a seabird hotspot in the world, and uh, half of the species worldwide, more than 150 uh, species are, are are distributed here in the North America. And this is, I think, the next data is the the, the central point. You know, we share 70 species. Uh, between Mexico, Canada, and US. So I think this is a great example that how can we protect and pro uh, promote the marine connectivity using the Versat example. Um, as you know, well, in the map, you can see this is some data. Uh, uh, Barbara talked as well the importance of the uh, scientific data uh, in order to identify where are the, the hotspots, where are the places that we need to protect. And well, you see the map. And uh, most of the birds usually migrates, migrates uh, between Mexico, U.S., and Canada. So uh, I repeat, this is a great example to to use as a indicators of uh, health of the ecosystems. So uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, most of these populations are highly threatened. Uh, mo many of them are very, very threatened. Many, uh, many others are not. Uh, in a high risk, but well, the good point and the, the good thing is that I've seen uh, on the many projects in Mexico, US, and Canada that we can restore the ecosystem for those birds. And uh, it's a we have a big chance to restore the islands, to restore the coast or the coastal areas. Uh, but we need to work together because this is a shared issue, right? I mean, we can protect many areas in one country, but if we are not protected in other one, I mean, we need to 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 share. To, we need to promote this connectivity. So, on the next one, uh, I'm gonna tell you this is a very nice project uh, uh, that we started uh, last year, and it's about the translocation of black-footed ferret, uh, ferret, sorry, black-footed albatrosses from Midway Atoll in National Wildlife Refuge in US to Guadalupe Island, to Guadalupe Island Biosphere Reserve in Mexico. I think this is a very, very nice example of all the points that Barbara said uh, in order to promote the ecological connectivity, considering the environmental factors. This species and this project is special because most of the population of these birds are in Hawaii, and they live in a very low altitude uh, island. So 
in a climate change scenario and we are all already we are living that the impacts of the climate change are having a great impact a negative impact on those islands so if this pattern continue basically this population will we will be lost in the next decades so one example of, and the, the, of this project what is aiming is to create and establish a, a new population in Mexico in a in a in an island that will be uh, no suffer the uh, impacts of climate change in order to protect this species I mean we are talking in a in a decades and this is a, a project that uh, it's considering the ocean effect the, the effects of ocean processes the climate change and the habitat suitability modeling you know this this pro this project involved include a lot of uh, researchers, a lot of people who is looking the best way to protect this species. Uh, basically, uh, in, in just in a detail, in uh, 2021, uh, 20 uh, we, we move X. This is nice. I mean, very interesting. Uh, we can share later more details, but we move X from Hawaii to Guadalupe Island. And they put the eggs on the uh, uh, Lysan albatrosses nest, you know, and the Lysan albatros and uh, Lysan albatrosses uh, take care of the black-footed albatross. So it was very nice. And they, then the next few few months later, uh, twelve chicks were moved in the same in the same way in order to to we, they they put the, the chicks on the island. And they take care of the chicks, and the, the this project was very successful. By the end, uh, two or three months, what two, one or two months ago, all the the chicks grow, grown, and they they leave the island. They went to the ocean, and then we are expecting in the three the three or next or the next three or five years, uh, we are expecting that those chicks will come back to the island to. Uh, to continue the cycle, so I well I I, I use this example because it's a great uh, project in order to demonstrate the that we the, how the uh, the protected marine areas uh, need to be connected and the three countries in order to save a species also in a, a climate change scenario. But I, I want to finish with this. Uh, I think it's an aspect that we need to talk uh, more on the on the forum, and it's about the collaboration. I think we understand the marine connectivity, uh, the patterns, uh, just using the best science data. We know that technical part, but I think one important thing on the ecological connectivity is the collaboration among the countries. So if you go the next, Richard, please. Uh, this project is possible because of that because the the connective the, the collaboration that we have on the between the both countries Mexico and US and not just the, the federal governments we in this project it's involved a lot of NGOs private sector uh, the, the people actually living on the island the, the managers of the marine protected areas so I think collaboration is something that we need to to discuss and and strength this this idea of uh, collaboration to, to to promote ecological connectivity so that's my part thank you so much for the opportunity i think this forum is going to be excellent in order to discuss these and other points so thank you so much alexander and thank you, oh, th thank you eduardo um thank you for sharing that it's, it's such an exciting project because of all of the the range of partners that are involved in that um Last, our, our third speaker here, um, I'm going to turn it over to Fred Horsky. Fred? Very much. I'm speaking to you from, oops, we could go forward to that uh, slide you just had on. That would be mine. Um, I'm speaking to you from Halifax at Dalhousie University, where I look after a project called the Ocean Tracking Network, um, which is a global network of scientists and infrastructure that is using electronic telemetry systems to track the movements and survival of marine animals, primarily fishes. Living in Halifax and speaking to the issue of connectivity, 
Um, we are absolutely totally dependent on a connected ocean in order to support our coastal communities. Most of the animals that we have our fisheries predicated upon only move here in the spring, summer, and autumn. And because of the Canadian winter, leave because productivity drops to nothing and there's no reason for them to be here. So those big fisheries are really critical for us. And the only way it works is when they, the animals can move to meet their needs. And we do have them moving from as far as the Gulf of Mexico up to here in a regular and ongoing fashion. In order to track and document the movements of these animals, humans are not very good to follow them individually. We can't swim as fast or as long as something like a tuna cat. So what we have to fall back on is a series of electronic telem telemetry types. And I'm told that everybody here wants to get down into the nuts and bolts. So this is the first nuts and bolts slide surrounding this. There are basically three kinds of electronic telemetry systems we work with. The first are termed data loggers. These are relatively small and totally self-contained units. They have on board a battery and a memory chip that stores umpteen observations that may be made by these animals. They have sensors on board them for things like light, and the light sensors are used to determine the position of the animals, latitude and longitude based on day length and the rates of changing day length from one day to another. Think of this as shooting the sun, a little bit like the old time sailors used to do with their sextants to determine their positions. And they have a disadvantage of costing about 450 US dollars each to do this, but they can go on small animals up to large animals. The other major disadvantage you have is you have to get them back to get your data back. But if you can do that, what you have is a course track that can show you minute by minute where the animal was and what the environmental conditions were that the animal was experiencing. But it, it won't tell you anything about the animals that died and you never got the tag back on, which may be exactly the animals that you want to know what happened. Second class of tags are called satellite tags. Um, there are a number of different types, but one I have here is something called a pop-up satellite tag. It has all of the same sensors and capabilities and light geolocation capacity of the data loggers on board, plus a big battery. But it has the advantage that at the end of its term, either because the animal dies or because it's programmed to let go after about a year, which is as long as the battery will last, it pops to the surface and will broadcast the data that it has collected to you through the satellite network. So you don't lose anything and you get a detailed description of it. It can only get onto animals sized about a meter length or longer because it is a very big tag. And the second problem it has is it only lasts about a year. So maybe if you have a long life big animal, you don't cover all the time you need to cover. And the third problem is the price tag surrounding it, which is anywhere from three to $7,000 US per, per tag. So these tend to go on the high valued species like bluefin tuna, uh, sharks that are endangered, other things like that. Now, the third class of tags is somewhere in between. These are called acoustic tags. They put out an acoustic signal uniquely keyed to each individual fish. So it doesn't matter what species you put it in, as long as you record the number of the tag and the data about the species it was at the time it was tagged. They come in many different sizes. The smallest is less than the size of your little fin finger's fingernail. Um, the largest is about the size of the biggest tag you see there. What you're trading off is battery size, which trades off the longevity of the tag. So the smallest tags will last for 120 days. For small fish, that may be enough to tell you everything you need to know about them. The larger ones can last up to 20 years with the programming, which will tell you a lot about an animal that may, through its growth patterns, its ontogeny, change its behavior as it moves from a juvenile to an adult phase. The tags themselves ping away. They can be heard at a distance of about a kilometer away from receiver units. So you have to go out in the ocean and place receivers. And the ocean is a big place. So you need a lot of receivers that are out in the ocean. And that is a lot of the work that I do, is trying to bring together all of these receiver units that are actually already out in the ocean and create a network that can serve the global science community surrounding that. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is what the Ocean Tracking Network is really all about, is trying to bind together the acoustic receiver units that are already present in the ocean. I deploy and maintain approximately 4,000 per year. These are intended to supplement and to support the individual efforts of other investigators or other networks of people that work with this technology. 
And what we do is we bound them all together because they're all compatible through a common data system. That is where half of my staff are involved. They are an associate data unit of the International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange and a tier two node for the Ocean Biogeographic Information Service to collect tag numbers from all of these disparate groups and to feed out detections to people so that they can discover where their animals are going when they move beyond the range of what they may tag in Mexico or in the United States or in Canada for that matter. Our data system is built on fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable principles and OCAP principles. This was developed by First Nations in North America about ownership, control, access, and possession the rights of Indigenous people to own and control their data. Currently, we have about one terabyte of detections in our system. We've worked on 294 species in 51 countries. We have 837 projects that are currently underway from 329 institutions. So the key with the acoustic infrastructure is maintain long-term deployments where they are needed, but also have it to be adaptable and it be rapidly brought to the surface, reconfigured, moved to a new place to address the new needs that are happening. With that kind of capacity, you can see where it would do a number of interesting things to let you follow the patterns of movements and survival of marine animals, um, their connectivity, i.e. habitat use, how long do they stay in our particular place before moving on to the next one. And to give you an example of that, I'd like to move to my last slide and show you a dossier we're working right now. So this is a picture of a white shark taken off of Halifax approximately three weeks ago. For about 20 years, we've had a virtual absence of white sharks from Canadian waters, which probably knocked into the endangered category, both in Canada and in the U United States by bycatch in commercial fishing. It was not a targeted fishery. And only now are we beginning to see a little resurgence in the population. Down below, you would see some a satellite tag record showing the movements of five white sharks. This was done by Dr. Greg Scomo in Massachusetts, showing that they were basically pulled back and holding in a distribution down in the United States. And actually some of those were penetrating into the Gulf of Mexico as well uh, prior to approximately 2005. But more recently, we've begun to see an expansion of these animals back into Nova Scotia waters. They're cropping up at a great frequency. Um, about 150 of these animals now have acoustic tags on them, tagged by three primary groups, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, Greg Scomo, OSEARCH is another group that many of you may have heard something about, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans DFO here in Canada. Um, we've had some very negative interactions with people in Massachusetts and Maine. We've had three fatal attacks in the last five years by swimmers encountering the white sharks as they reoccupy their habitats. And what we're trying to figure out is what is going on here? Which are the ones that are coming up? It looks like it's juveniles that are beginning to be pushed out of perhaps the competitive range farther south that was preserved and reoccupying something that was historic. We are finding degrees of site fidelity in the animals. We're finding the same animal is coming back to the same area in Canada for two, three, sometimes four years consecutively. And some of these are actually marine protected areas like the muskwash marine protected area. So we're able to show the degree to which this endangered species may be using those MPAs. We also think that our technology is also going to help a lot with looking at pictures that are beyond who, what species did what, when, where, what happened, but ecosystem interactions. So in our particular case, we've had a lot of fishermen that are very angry at seals because seals eat cod and the cod haven't recovered so we don't have our fisheries anymore and they keep calling for culls of the seal population which would be an absolute disaster from the perspective of international relations and boycotts of canadian seafood projects should anything like that ever happen the solution to it is white sharks which do two things first of which they actually feed on seals, so they're going to be reducing the population as part of the natural restoration of the ecosystem and food webs that are present. But the second thing is they'll change the behavior of the seals. The seals won't be able to congregate in exactly the same numbers in the same ways that they were before. And this is probably going to give a leg up to the cod to actually begin to recover if there really was a problem due to seal predation upon the cod. So that's the kind of things that we do with electronic telemetry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fred, um, and thank you to all three of you for sharing such such specific pieces um, of these different points of work. Um, 
I want to make sure that we, we have time for the different project level discussions and interactivity. Um, but before we let all three of you go, um, I want to um, ask each of you to just share a little bit about from your work, um, what's, what do you see as one key way that managers can better act towards ecological connectivity? Um, Barb, clearly one of those is always consider ecological connectivity in MPA design. Um, so I'm going to take that one off the table to start with. Um, but just running through based on the programs you've seen, what's worked well and what hasn't, um, given that we have so many practitioners in the room, um, what's one piece of, of advice or suggestion that you would have for all of them? Um, whoever wants can go first and I'll, I'll call around on different people. I think from my point of view, I am seeing, um, well, first of all, to, to give you a little bit of a background on how we get our input, we've been, we interact uh, with the 80 or so members of the Marine Connectivity Working Group that have signed up. And in fact, for the end of this day, um, I can give you some information if you all want to sign up and you haven't already done so. So we get a lot of uh, back and forth from these folks and presently actually have a survey out where we're giving, we're asking more specific questions. The results are due back at the end of the month. I think that the biggest thing is just this uncertainty of what is connectivity. Um, and, and thankfully now, you know, IUCN, first we had protect, marine protected areas and then we had the OECM, which is other uh, important effective conservation measures. And now we have ecological corridors and networks of ecological conservation. So I think these will help. I think that um, we have to rely so much on the technology. And that's why what Fred was saying is, is so important. But that technology, we have to have the possibility of making access to that technology and the data that's produced worldwide. Um, and there's still a lot of training that needs to be done with managers, even if they are having the possibility of access, how they use it, do they have the equipment to be able to manipulate it and, and apply it in their, in their um, marine environment? So I, I think really there's just tremendous amount of learning and using, um, understanding what it is and then using technology to help get some confidence on how connectivity is affecting the marine uh, protected areas, biodiversity and so important. Well, hopefully we can do some of that learning here today um, as part of this and, and through the NIMPED network as well. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Eduardo, I might come to you next. Um, and th maybe I think you have such an interesting role in that you work also on terrestrial species. Um, and so I wonder whether there's any advice you might have for marine practitioners that comes from that broader perspective as well. Thank you, Alexander. I think it's a great question, but a challenging one as well. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think uh, the, 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 for, for me, one of the most important things here is also to understand the effects of the threats. I mean, we, we can take advantage of the technology. We can take advantage of the uh, scientific knowledge that is a lot in, in the three countries. But I think we need to understand as well what are the impacts of the main threats and we have we are living in a lot of threats and climate change is one of them but it's a necessary that coming in the next decades probably we are living in some places right now but i think we have a current threats are uh, very very important that we need to take uh, actions on it i mean uh, on the marine corridor in order to keep the marine corridors we all know that uh, threats like uh, fisheries or uh, pollution are a big issues that we need to treat. And we need to treat not just uh, talking about, uh, between the um, environmental sector. I mean, the main, I mean, an advice or something that I can say is we need to take as well to, con to, to, to contact and talk 
with the other sectors, you know, the productivity sectors, the fishery sectors, the tourism sector, because that there is the key in order to pro, to promote this connectivity. You know, uh, one example also I want to say a, an example uh, related with the the corridors related with whales. You know, we we know that there's a lot of whales are moving between the three countries among the three countries. And the entanglement is a big issue that uh, uh, we are dealing here in Mexico, and we don't know if this the, the the net is coming from the U.S. or they will come back to Canada with a Mexican net. We don't know, and this is the importance to use the technology that uh, um, that Fred was telling us. No, how can we uh, track those threats between the three countries? But well. Coming back to the point, I think the, the collaboration, not just between the environmental sector, but the other sectors are the key in order to, to promote the, the, the conservation, the restoration, and the connectivity between the marine protected areas. Fantastic. No, I think that's such a good point of making sure that we do look outside of our own, our own spaces as well. And I think we have a bunch of projects that we'll talk about today that look at some of the social connectivity around ecological protection as well um, and working with the communities, um, fishing communities and beyond. Um, Fred, uh, last point of advice comes, comes so, from you. So what, what's keeping me up at night now is as we move into the decade, uh, what's happened is a, a lot of publicity about the ocean and about how we need to do things, but there has been a tendency to focus on a few things like plastics, temperature, deoxygenation and acidification in the ocean is a major thrust. And those are going to get the support and the governments will be behind them and they'll be contained there. But as Jose was just pointing out, we're facing the blue growth industrial revolution of the ocean right now. There's no place in the ocean we cannot get to with commercial technology to develop and do things now. And it's happening and it's happening as a cum cumulative impact, many different things in many different places and maintaining our corridors are going to be absolutely critical in the face of this one. And it means that the kinds of coverage to know what's going on and what we need to do to protect it has to be far more massive than we have out there for almost everything that we're measuring. And what that circles back to is the idea that everybody who is working in the ocean has to be thinking not just about my own little project here now, but who else do I contact about sensors they may want to put on it, my mooring, my my site for this time, so that we get that additional information that comes in and feeds that that bigger picture. But how do you organize this when it's going to be such a grassroots level for things? It has to be organized almost at a global scale to make that one happen. So that that is something that is critical and MPAs potentially as monitoring sites. Um, could be an absolute gem in, in this particular goal and trying to make connections with these other researchers and say, well, we got a boat and we're going to be out there going to it, doing things and we have a buoy. And if you want to attach one of your sensors to it, send it to us and we'll do it in. And suddenly everybody's getting the stuff that they need. So I think those are three really great pieces, right? So um, really looking at being proactive about bringing in new partners to see where we can leverage shared infrastructure. Um, so that everyone gets better data, gets better access, um, making sure we're connecting outside of our silos in terms of the uh, sectors that we're talking with and bringing into the to the table in the management discussion, um, and really learn, trying to spend the time learning about what data is there and how to use it um, as we get more and more data, right? I think those are three interconnected pieces that speak to all of your different areas so well, um, and I thank all three of you for um, sharing those and sharing your work. Um, I will say a virtual round of applause. If everyone wants to find your reaction emoji, you can do that too. Um, 